T Rex. <sighs> Sorry. Mm. Good dinosaur. Right. Okay. This is a film that they've been wanting to make for a little over uh, about 12 years by the time this film came out, somewhere around there. It's an idea they had a long time ago. Remember, one of the core ideas of the Pixar films is what if, right? Concept pieces. What if the dinosaurs never went extinct? What if the asteroid never hit? Okay. Cool. That's a pretty cool what if concept. It would be nice if they did something with it. I'm sorry. I'm being very unkind. Um, so they put this thing together, and they're like, all right, cool, cool. We'll bring in Bob Peterson. He worked on Up. And Peter Sohn, who's a story artist. Okay. Okay, it's cool. We'll hire the cast. We'll do the script. Everything's going to be awesome. And they actually bring in... John Lithgow is in this film. Notice I use past tense. And they film other lines, and they record other lines, and they're pretty far into production. They have a delay because of tech issues, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And then it's like, okay, cool. But we get, we get the film going, and and it sucks. And everyone who saw it said the same thing. They're just like, wow, this, this really sucks. We can't release this. What do we do? I don't know. So... They fired the director. I'm just going to say it that way, Bob Peterson. Now, they didn't fire him from the company. He went on to work on other things, but you'll notice that he doesn't really do much directing after this. <laughs> he is canned from the project. And they're like, okay, no problem. Uh, we just need someone to replace him. So naturally, they bring in four separate directors. Okay. Obviously, a film, something as complex and immense that takes years to make like this, can't really be pointed to a singular point of failure. It usually doesn't work that way. It's very rare that there's one thing that screws up an entire film. But I would say this is probably the single biggest reason why this screwed up. First, they had, so they, they built the film. And when I say built the film, let me, let me rehash this. This is important. I've talked before about how they've had story ideas and they torpedoed it and they rehauled it. I just talked about that with Inside Out, for God's sakes. That turned out fine. I gotta stress that this was at a level that hadn't been seen before. They were well into production and had started doing post when they overhauled it. They had lines recorded. They had animation done. They had scenes rendered. They were getting to the point of actually piecing together the final product and that's when they were like, ah, we need to redo this and effectively started the whole film over with massively reduced time and budget because they'd already been working on this thing for years. I mentioned tech issues. Well, as usual, they really wanted to push the tech forward. Understandable. I I'm sure if you know anything about this film, you probably know the most commonly touted thing, which is the environment. Uh, allow me to join that crowd. The environment in this film is legitimately amazing. Now, watching this on 4K is even more impressive, if I might be so bold, because you really can see the stupid amount of effort and work and, and power, I don't have a better word for it, that they put into the backgrounds, the terrain, the mountains, the forests, the, the, the grass swaying and the wind and the clouds and just everything. The environment is straight up some of the most gorgeous stuff I have ever seen in my entire life, bar none. Absolutely blown, about, blown away by the quality here. That's the tech issue. That's why they did the initial pushback. That wasn't really that big of an issue. That's kind of normal for Pixar, really. It's like, okay, you know, we're not crunchy anymore, remember? Ever since Toy Story 2, we learned our lesson. So we're going to push it back so we can involve the tech some more. If you remember, I talked about this back in Inside Out. They also had to develop an entirely new method for rendering in order to get the clouds to work, in order to actually have clouds rendered rather than simply being painted. So they could work with that too. And all of this stuff was just top-notch, top-of-the-line, holy crap, amazo. It's fantastico. And I'm going to keep praising it too. Lord knows this film needs it. Here's the problem. This is when we get into that wonderful little downside of being a company that's trying to push tech forward. Star Wars has actually run into this problem, too, if you're paying attention. Sometimes when you're trying really hard to push the tech forward, you sort of accidentally neglect the piece of work and art that you're pushing forward to, with the tech that you are developing. 
Good Dinosaur is probably one of the most stark examples I've seen of something where it is amazingly technically impressive, even more than Cars, and is substantially less enjoyable to watch, and was a financial flop, which I'll talk about later as well. Even more than Cars. I mean, Cars at least made tons and tons of money on the merchandising circuit, whereas Good Dinosaur actually lost money on that. But again, I'll cover that in a minute. So, that was the first thing. That was the tech thing, okay? And they were way in production, hit the brakes, hit the stream brakes, completely overhauled everything, okay? And uh, I, I don't know how to further emphasize this. They, they, they did a second delay. Because, like I said, they, they had to overhaul the entire script and completely replace entire actors. And it's just, I, I can't believe. The issues that went into this film is nightmarish. It has been argued that this film was something of a career ender for multiple people. I mean, a creative flop is one thing. You know, nobody really <laughs> cries about the fact that Transformers 2 was a terrible film. It sold well. But Good Dinosaur didn't sell well. And that makes the money people notice and... They went up to Yellowstone, did a lot of terrain research. Again, lots of effort. There are people out there, I will go ahead and count myself among them, who would be mistaken that there are specific scenes that aren't just actual real-life shots of terrain. Because they could have gotten away with that. They could have just taken out a drone and taken some nice you know, high-def shots and panning shots and done that. They could have actually gotten away with that for several sections of this film. Especially since it is effectively set in the Yellowstone area. It is up in the uh, United States Northwest region. <sighs> the water. Have I mentioned the water? God, the rendering on the water is... Oh, I, I, I can't... I can't vocalize it. I cannot put into words sufficiently just how incredibly good this film looks. Please, do yourself a favor. If you haven't seen this film, I don't blame you. But, like, pull up a YouTube of just some of the environmental shots, especially one that has proper definition. Or if you have, if you own the Blu-ray for some reason. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, definitely. Um, just pull it up and just watch the background. You play it on mute if you have to. Put, put some of your own music on. Put some Morrowind music or something on. It is legitimately gorgeous. But I promised you economics talk, and I'm pretty sure that's the only reason anybody watches me at this point. So, why is this film a failure? Now, creatively, that's a little bit more complex. We'll be talking about that as we go along. But financially, that's a little bit more concrete. Let's go through the tr the steps, shall we? Step number one, trailer. If you paid attention, I paused and just talked about trailers as a concept back during Inside Out. Now, that was partially because of the fact that it was very relevant to Inside Out, but it was also to establish some discussion about what trailer is and trailer design for this very film. Pro tip, don't do this. You, I, you could literally just point to Hydro. No, like, here you go. Here you go. It's, it's, uh, it's. <laughs> Don't do this. This is a perfect example of what not to. I'm not actually joking. There, there's no humor in my tone here. They, uh, showed all of the big action sequences. So there's nothing to enjoy there. Okay. Let me, let me actually talk this through. First of all, they spoiled stuff. So all the story beats, completely spoiled. Second of all, they actually show scenes from the climax. Never do that. Godzilla, King of Monsters, made the same mistake. Third of all, and related to the aforementioned King of Monsters, they also show big action sequences in the trailer. Now, I know there is a need to show some kind of action in a trailer. That's something that is debated to be true. Here's the catch. I want you to imagine uh, the, the so-called money shot when it comes to uh, films or shows. Like the really big, awesome moments. I'm not even going to mention any for reasons I'll discuss in just a moment. It'll, it'll become apparent in a moment here. But picture it. Picture like Independence Day or picture Star Wars or picture uh, freaking Transformers if you have to. Whatever it is you want to think of. Uh, picture Godzilla King of Monsters. You know, whatever era, whatever range. Picture the big, awesome moment. It's not a big character piece, usually. It's not a narrative thing. It's more on the equivalent of the gameplay axis of the film. It's the thing where you're supposed to be in there in the theater going, oh. and usually there's some audio design that helps complement it as well, right? You know, it's prong, kind of a moment. Now, okay, you've pictured that? Now picture that that's in the trailer. Now you might think, oh, that'll get me so interested to see that, in which case, uh, you're an alien, clearly. I'm afraid I found another alien. I'm going to have to chop it down. No, my point is, that is spoiling. It is. It is not the same exact thing as spoiling, but it is the same concept. 
Spoiling refers to giving away a plot twist, like it was his sled. But spoiling, think about the word for a moment. Just dismiss it from the specific usage from narrative. And think about spoiling a really cool boss fight in a video game. Think about spoiling a really cool camera shot that is this big panning reveal of this awesome graphical section. Think about spoiling the big climactic battle between the two monsters towards the end of the film. Think about spoiling the massive transformation sequence that one of the bigger Transformers goes through. You see what the concept is here? By giving that away, you have done the same thing as spoiled it. This is actually one of the reasons I have that phrase, no mentioning. Which is, which is another tier. Like, no spoiling is easy. Most people follow that rule. But no mentioning is a different one, and most people are against me on this one, but that's okay. I stand by it. And this is why. You give away those big moments, they no longer have the same impact. That might be good, bad, or neither. But one way or another, you have taken that moment away from that person. You have robbed them of it, and now they can only be watching the film knowing that scene is coming, and effectively waiting for it. Now, I didn't mention this back during the Inside Out thing, but one of the other tricks you can do with regards to trailers is to come up with entirely new footage that is just for the trailer. Now, they've actually done that before. Uh, they did that with uh, Monsters, Inc., for example. And the MCU is actually rather famous for doing that as well, for coming up with footage that is only in the trailer or is completely altered for the trailer. That's actually a pretty good idea, too, because then you can just put whatever you want there. None of that's in the film, so all, most of the other rules don't apply. There's no spoiling, there's no spoiling, there's no mentioning, it's just, hey, come see our film, it includes these characters, and they'll be doing stuff kind of like this, right? <sighs> but this film gave away those big moments, the climax moments, the fight, the re several of the reveals, the, the fact that the dad dies, so many of, the, basically the entire film it could be watched by just watching the trailer. Don't do that. Now, forgive me for expounding upon that point, but again, it, it's an important point, I think, and one of the reasons why trailers need to be completely overhauled as a concept. And again, this affects games and movies both. It's it's a really bad problem for both mediums. Anyways, so, problem number one, the trailer spoiled everything. This has had a historically proven impact on sales. There are many, many films out there where a specific type of trailer, especially of the spoiling variety, has come out, and sales have been demonstrably lower than they should be as a direct result of that. I'm pretty sure you could come up with a few examples of that just right off the top of your head. Problem number one, trailer. Okay. What's problem number two? Well, um... They anticipated that this film would be a huge Cars follow-through. As in, remember, Cars had decent box office returns, but really made all its money on merchandising. And they were going to merchandise the hell out of this one. Which meant they already had deals lined up and production cycled up so that those toys and those shirts and all those other fun little things could be ready to go when the film went live. And this film did not move units. So that's a lot of money spent on stuff that didn't get sold. Ouch. That's actually the majority of the losses of this film right there, by the way. So that's the big one. Point number three. This film came out five months after Inside Out. That didn't help anything. Now, we have seen before that that doesn't necessarily hurt sales because there are other factors other than that, and five months is actually a decent chunk of time. But it's real I mention it here because it probably did affect the sales figures, since there are plenty of people who really can only budget or allocate one or two movies a year, and this was the year that Force Awakens came out. Oh yeah, by the way, this film came out 19 days before Force Awakens. That's point number four now. More than the Inside Out thing, the Force Awakens thing probably absolutely destroyed this film <laughs> with regards to ticket sales. Okay, anything else? Actually, yes. Problem number five. This was the era of information by the time this film came out. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I've just kind of started mentally thinking of this as the Solo effect, as in after the Han Solo film. If you remember, I don't blame you if you do, if you ever actually saw the rumination, I discussed at length all of the stuff that went into Solo and why it was not particularly well successful financially. Now, there was a lot of there, and I'm not going to go into the whole details, but the biggest thing in my opinion, well, the second, the second biggest thing, sorry, the second biggest reason why Solo did not make money. I know what you're thinking. No, it's not that. If you saw the rumination, you know that. It's instead the fact that it had a horrifically troubled production. Now, you're probably thinking, 
Well, most films have troubled productions. Well, there's a difference between we have a troubled production and we have a horrifically troubled production. And horrifically troubled productions tend to get news bites because news media is designed to sell clicks and to sell views and eyeballs. So they tend to push those kind of stories. So when a studio is having trouble, it gets reported on. A film having production issues tends to get interest and that tends to affect sales. Now, this is not a universal truth. There are examples where there has been a horrifically troubled production and it's sold just fine. In gaming, this is the same general concept, though. If there's a game that's having a bad production cycle, people tend to know about it. And, you know, there's not really a lot you can do about that at that point. Because uh, uh, early sales, initial sales, you know, that initial 90% of the first two weeks, or whatever the actual figure is, are severely hurt because of the fact that people just don't have faith in the product anymore. This, of course, leads me to the final problem. Um, this, this is the most obvious thing, but the long, troubled, doubled production cycle absolutely hurt them because they still had to pay all the people and all the time and all the effort. All of those hours cost, involved cost for while they were, you know, not producing the film or rather producing the film that didn't actually go to screens. They effectively paid for a movie and a half here in order to get this thing. All of these reasons, I've, I've lost track, I think we're up to six. One, two, three, four, five, six, yep. All these reasons are why this film actually lost money. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, but Laura, I thought it cost $175 million and made back 332 This is when those figures kind of go into the gray area. I report on those figures because those are the open and obvious figures, and it's easy to kind of gauge success that way. But the problem is, even if this film had made the 160 ish uh, that, that, that implies, I think it's like 158 or something like that. Um, that's still kind of low. That doesn't take into account the toy problem, the merchandising problem I already mentioned. And that doesn't actually take into account the double and a half production cycle. So between those two additional things, this film, for once, unlike Alien, as I reported earlier this year, unlike Alien, this film actually did lose money. Not great. Now. <laughs> Let's jump into the, the movie proper here. But I mentioned before, final time I'm actually going to bring this up, because I think this is pretty much the definitive moment. When does Pixar dip in quality? This is probably the last point in which Pixar could be considered to have dipped for the first time in quality. If anybody disagrees, please feel free to, as ever and always. I don't want to make your opinion for you. That's not my job, at least until the device is done. But the point is... You know, if it wasn't Cars 2, if it wasn't, you know, uh, uh, Brave, which some people think, you know, if it wasn't Monsters, Inc., which some people think, whichever film it is you think where Pixar dipped in quality, most people have run into one by now. This is also the first film where the studio executives said that the dip in quality happened. Now, you're probably thinking, they didn't think the previous stuff dipped? No, because the previous stuff sold. That's the problem. As I said before... No matter how good the creative work is, at the end of the day, the money people make decisions based on the amount of money made relative to their expectations of the money they think they should be making. So, even though this film, you know, is whatever it is, creatively, it didn't matter because it actually lost money, which means it's a flop. Terrain! God, I love the terrain! Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry to gush. <laughs> this this terrain is beautiful and gorgeous. Then... I, so I, I, I really actively dislike actual negative territory. Do not like the design of the dinosaurs in this film. There's probably, I'd say, one exception to that. Maybe. They look too Play-Doh to me. Now, I don't know how much of this is a deliberate design choice, or how much of this is a, we had to make the film another time and a half. <laughs> or, or rather, you know what I mean, you know what I mean. Um, I don't know. But given, the problem is, the terrain looks close to real. And the dinosaurs look extremely cartoony. Like, so cartoony that they... I mean, Rex looks better than these dinosaurs in several ways. I hate to say that. Rex, specifically in Toy Story 3, to be clear. When they had, you know, figured out a lot of what they're doing. So this is just kind of a, what? Now, I would be willing to forgive that. Style is style. 
you know, aesthetics are aesthetics. The problem, well, I, I, you've probably already figured it out. The problem is the two are right next to each other. There's a specific scene, I was going to reference it later, but you know, let's get all this out of the way up front. There's a specific scene later where uh, Arlo is laying his head on a rock, and that rock looks like a real freaking rock with just the right glisten and the kind of dots of reflection as the light is being reflected off of the indents into the imperfect smooth surface of the rock to indicate its its rough texture to it and the water's pouring through it and it looks freaking real and then there's Arlo's head just laying on it and the contrast just makes my mind go <laughs> while I'm watching it this is a constant this is throughout the entire film because the whole film has this aesthetic. Even most of the creatures and critters look reasonably realistic. There are exceptions. Anything with big eyes is an exception. But, you know, like the random lizard or the snake. Or uh, there's a bit where there's like the little... Uh, the birds are another good example. Some of the birds, they look like real creatures. Or at least very, very close to real creatures. You know, photorealistic is the term. And then there's the, there's the cartoon that they're standing right next to. But let's move on for now. Let's move on. So, actually, let me let me bring up one more point while I'm here. I talked about this during Inside Out. You remember that? Oh, by the way, this is my first time seeing this film. Just to get that anecdote out of the way. Um, the in, during Inside Out, they used the deliberate attempt to look more realistic with both San Francisco and the people in order to directly contrast the inside of the mind to look substantially more cartoony. I praised that. So you're probably thinking, why aren't you praising this here? Well, if you are, then you're missing the point, because the inside of the mind was, for lack of a better way to put it, a completely separate dimension with codified hard barriers in between that and the rest of it. Allow me to use another example of this. The Lego movies. When you're in the Legoverse, it looks like a Lego. It's, it's well done, and in many cases it actually looks like real Legos, but it's still Lego cartoons, right? When they cut to real life, which is actually live action in that case, it looks like live action. It looks like they're putting a camera around Lego sets. And so the contrast is there. There's still this barrier there. And when one crosses over to the other, they are then portrayed in the new format and vice versa. This barrier of separation is not just a, a, a you know a literal thing or a metaphorical thing, but also a matter of visual design. Uh, visual distinction is something I talk about constantly. And uh, it's mostly in game design. But it's a big important element of movie and filmmaking, any any visual medium, just the same. Because having something be visually distinct, there's a whole art and design to that. And making sure that that distinction is something that is segregate from the other thing, so you can tell that's a that and this is a this, is also important. Instead, what we have is a cartoon laying down on a real rock. And it's wrong. I say wrong. I, I, that feels like the, the incorrect word usage. But what I mean by that is it looks off, right? It, it looks wrong. It looks like there's something wrong. And my brain is... That's why I was like... Rrr, rrr, because my brain is trying to process it, failing at it, right? Moving on. So, eggs. Uh, first two eggs hatch. Cool. And then there's this giant egg, which has this tiny little dinosaur. Question. Considering that Buck actually hit the egg before it was even starting to hatch, do you think it wasn't ready to hatch? I, I'm just just a random theory I wanted to toss out there. I have very few theories about the film because we'll get to that in a minute. But I'm just curious because this is one of the thoughts I had. I wonder if that forced what is effectively a premature birth and he was hatched when he wasn't ready and that might explain some of his development issues. Just random thought. Um. So... And I'm about 20 minutes through the film now. I have so little to say about the narrative of this film. It's so boring. Let me talk about that, because that is my job. What if the dinosaurs were never whacked out? Okay, that's cool. That's interesting. Uh, you, you have an idea for that? Do you have an idea for that? I'm sure several of you in chat right now have ideas for that. Let me give a, the most obvious one. Make the humans be here, too. Humans and, and dinosaurs who have learned to live side by side writes itself as far as I'm concerned. And remember, one of the things that Pixar really loves to do in their concept pieces, which is their main wheelhouse, is to show those Bugs Life moments. I would argue there is no Bugs Life moment in this film. 
Now, you could argue back, and I wouldn't contest it too much, because we see how the Apatosaurus's farm, and we see how the Tyrannosaurus's herd, um, and that's it, those two moments. But that's it, and that's my point. Th- these are just dinosaurs who are kind of here, and there's no real significance to the fact that they're here. It's just dinosaurs. This could have been said 65 million years ago, and for all intents and purposes, nothing would have been changed, other than the fact that there would be no humans. Right? And see, here's the problem. There are no humans in this film. Hear me out. What there is in this film is dogs. Now, I don't mean that as an insult. I know people like to say, oh, you dog as an insult. I don't know why. Why is that an insult? Dogs are awesome. I don't even like dogs and dogs are awesome. I can freely admit and understand that. So why? They're dogs. They are dogs. They act like dogs. They behave like dogs. They are the loyal, smaller companions... They howl, they walk around, they, 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 they're dogs, they're dogs, in, in almost every behavioral manner. These are not human beings, they're freaking dogs. So why are they humans? Why bother at that point? Oh yeah, by the way, they also look cartoony, to, to even further add to the problem that I mentioned earlier with regards to the terrain issue. So, solution number one, eject the humans entirely. Just make it a film about dinosaurs. We had a TV show about that. I think we can make this work. Option number two. Make them humans. Turn them into human beings. And like I said, have them coexist and interact with the dinosaurs. And, I mean, God's sakes, Zootopia. Like I said, it writes itself. Dinosaurs and humans living side by side in a modern society. Done. That's idea number one to fix the film, by the way. I'm only going to have one other one later on. But, as always, I'm going to go ahead and pause it to you now. The question, how would you fix this film? Now, the idea I just mentioned would involve yet another script overhaul and would probably be kind of hard to pull off. But even if, let's say for a moment that you don't want to show the big city, you don't want to actually pull a Zootopia with tons and tons of different species of dinosaurs and animals and people all coexisting. You just want to show, you know, the plains in the West. Okay, that's fine. That actually would work. You could still imply... um, The kid could be someone who is actually lost. Maybe he ran away from home. Maybe he was someone who was left off at a at a trail or whatever and happened to roam out here and was just really, really hungry and so started eating from the, the corn there because they had corn. And oh, my crap. Oh, my God. Right. Oh, nom, 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 nom. oh, by the way, in this scenario, I'd make the humans and dinosaurs capable of talking because that just let's just jump over that barrier right there. Let's <laughs> just, just to solve that one quickly. And then, you know, the idea of you know, the rest of the film could kind of follow the same general beats. It would still probably be pretty boring, but it would at least be something. As Arlo tries to get him back to his camper area. And there could be inferences. There could be planes. There could be, you know, background elements. They could discuss what's going on in the city. Or how they're keep you know, the, those... Ugh, those frickin' triceratops, they keep trying to buy out the territory. I don't know why they're... Well, you know how it is. They've got this whole deal going with the, the North... Oh, yeah, I know. And you could just have little elements like that in the background. Dialogue bits that help infer some of the stuff that you don't have the money to show, right? Because, again, we're already running over budget here. That's the limiter. So, anyways, that's idea number one. So... um uh, to continue to complain, sorry, to continue to complain about the same problem here. So that's the human issue. But the other issue is the dinosaurs. What do we see of the dinosaurs? So the Apatosaurus is farm. And um, there's the, I wrote down what it was called. It's a uh, Styrocosaurus. He's got birds. Okay, that's cool. Well, he's got critters. Symbiotic relationship. Cool. We got the Rexes. They are ranchers. We've got the, they're not pterodactyls, but they're effectively pterodactyls. They're evil, I guess. I don't know. They're buzzards. Eh. And then we've got the meth addicts. Cool. Okay, so that's that's the dinosaurs. That's that's all the dinosaurs. You already see the problem here? That's it. You did a what if about what would happen if the dinosaurs were still going, and then you didn't answer the question. I would argue that the ranching T-Rexes is it. Even the farming sequences don't really impress me. You don't have to, to reference Zootopia, you don't have to build wide. You don't have to show me this massive breadth of all of these ideas that the dinosaurs are doing and how they're functioning and living, even though that would be awesome. But it would also be expensive, so build tall. Really flesh out these few families we see. Show how they interact with each other. Why are these ranchers who live effectively in walking distance, like probably a couple days trip, 
from the ran- from the farm who who run massive cattle rides. Why do they, why do they not even know about this farm? Why doesn't the farm know about them? They could have regular interactions. They could have trade. They could have knowledge of each other. They could they could be like the Rexes know them and like them, and that's one of the reasons why he could feel safe when the T Rexes charge up because it's like oh it's the Rexes thank God and he charges after the Rexes because he knows them. You you can build stuff here. You can develop stuff here. This is idea number two, by the way. Go tall. Really flesh out the individuals that we have on screen. Chunk out most of the padding because the pacing of this film is awful and there are huge, huge chunks of time where nothing is happening. Just, Just ax that and try to develop the characters you have in your work. Now... Uh, how do they build stuff? How do they keep the chicken? Why do they keep the chickens? I will give them two points, actually. Uh, number one, the mark thing. That's actually a cool idea. It's, it's like the beginnings of an idea, right? It's like, put your mark. You have to earn it, though. You have to do something to earn that mark. Okay, that's a nice little cultural thing that's never expanded or expounded upon, but okay, cool. Um, I love the terrible fence they have. That fence wouldn't keep out anything. I love it. This is... I, this is in my notes where I complain about the terrain problem again. The cartoons on the terrain thing. The faces make it worse. The rest of the bodies don't look great, but the faces are just... I don't want to say they look simple, but I don't have a better word for it. They look like they didn't actually spend the time really designing the faces. Instead, they're just faces, generically, and they're barely distinguishable from each other. All right, whatever. So then they find the human. Um, oh, then they mention that there's not enough food for winter, and they need, they need, they're they going to have issues if they don't deal with that. Just remember that for later. Um, so, okay, cool. Then the dog shows up. I'm just going to call him that. His name is Spot, for God's sakes. So the dog shows up. That's cool. Then a hurricane shows up. What? No, okay, I get it. You wanted nature to be the villain, which actually makes a lot of sense for this kind of setup, since dinosaurs don't have opposable thumbs, which would make the whole human-dinosaur coexistence thing even more cool of an idea, because the humans could build things for the dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs could produce things for the humans, and you could see kind of the symbiotic thing go on, but whatever, whatever. Storm. A hurricane. In the mountains... In the Pacific Northwest, this far inland. <sighs> Anyways, then they pull a Mufasa. And I'm sorry, I, I don't like to draw those kind of parallels because, frankly, I think too many people do that too easily. But this is the Lion King. This is the Lion King. <laughs> Even the way they frame the, oh, the water coming down the thing. And then he's, oh my gosh. And then he gets hit. But they don't have the, the guts to show it for whatever reason. That's actually funny in its own right. Did I mention that the merchandising failed? One of the most repeatedly commented things from... This is from analysts, so don't know if this is true or not. But one of their theories as to why the merchandising did so badly is the fact that the target audience for this film and the merchandising for this film, kids... Really didn't like this film because it was too scary. Hmm. Anyways. So, whatever. Death River kills him. Yay. And then we see the mother who is overworking herself basically to death. Actually collapses from exhaustion. After all, if they don't get enough food, they're not going to be doing well for the winter. Huh. Let's talk about the villain problem. At about, what is it, 30 minutes in? I didn't write down the number, did I? Quite a few ways into the film. Quite a ways into the film. It gets to the part where we uh, meet... God, I didn't even write down their name. Uh, Thund- no, Thunderclap. That's his name. Thunderclap. Cool. Now, they're the villains. They're not the only villains, but they're the main villains. Now, let me let me explain this a little bit. If you remember, I talked back in Brave about how there wasn't really a villain of Brave. And that's a statement I stand behind. Mordu was an obstacle that had to be overcome, and the villain of another story, but he was not the villain of that story. It was a classic tragedy. It worked very well for that. This tries to have it both ways and fails at both. This is probably the biggest def- objective example of the four directors problem I pointed out earlier. Because sometimes there is no villain. 
which I think would work very well for a work like this. And as we pointed out before, Pixar films tend to be pretty good at no villain stories. I mean, who was the villain back in Inside Out? Oh, that's right, there wasn't one, even though they originally wanted there to be one. So, the terrain being the villain, yeah, I'm, I'm with that. I'm cool, let's do it. But instead, periodically, these guys show up to be the villains. And by periodically, I mean twice. They, they show up twice to be the villains. And they are clearly slanted and shown to be villainous, not just obstacles to overcome. Like Mordu, again, Mordu was effectively a force of nature, more so than these guys are. Oh yeah, they're also religious zealots, because why not? Let's just tack that on there. I, whatever. I'm not even going to talk about the meth addicts later on, who are also portrayed in the same light, by the way. So the film didn't know how to both have villains and not, and it didn't pick a lane. And that's the problem. It should have either ejected the villainy entirely, embraced the villainy completely, or actually managed the admittedly very difficult balancing act of both having villains and not. I'm not even sure I can think of a movie off the top of my head that manages that balancing act. It's worth noting that there's another problem with these villains. They're pathetic. You know what they are? Hungry. They're, I mean, religious zealotry, but that has nothing to do with anything. It's just something that's mentioned as a trivia item before they go on to, to go to the rest of their characterization, which is they're hungry and they like eating things alive. That's it. The greatest level of depth that could be said here is A, when Thunderclap first shows up, he sounds disappointed that Arlo isn't, Arlo isn't uh, injured, because, you know, then he could it, eat him. And B, they, they express similarity with the dog, with Spot. You know, ah, it's a juicy one. And you get the idea that they've eaten these things before. So, you know, okay, that's, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that. Moving on. If you're paying attention, there's a common thread here. The beginnings of ideas. I talked about this all the way back in, I think it was either the Toy Story or the Bugs Life video. It was one of the first things I talked about when it came to Pixar's approach. Concepts. A what if, a concept, it's hard to flesh that out because, you know, we talked about this when we were talking about world building. Because the more you think about it, the less sense it makes, right? And so they tend to find, Pixar usually finds a nice middle ground of making enough sense and doing enough research to present it and presenting it very well so that you're willing to forgo the fact that, well, hang on a minute. There's a reason so many articles and YouTube's channels for decades, over a decade, I should say, at this point, have made their money and their living off of pointing out all of the, well, hang on a second, when it comes to Pixar films, right? Here's the catch, though. The problem with a concept is it, a concept starts with the simplest of questions. What if blank? But you have to develop that and work that into an actual concept, into something that can actually fill out a film before it, you, you do something with it. Otherwise, it's just, oh, that's neat. Oh, that's it? And that's good dinosaur in a nutshell. Oh, that's it? Allow me to give you another anecdote here. If you remember, during Brave, there was a point at which I had to do something. I forget what right now. And I noticed that the film only had like 20 minutes left. I was just like, oh my god. This film has been racing by in a good way. You know, I had noticed the time was passing because I was so engaged. And the pacing was so good. Exact opposite problem here. At one point, I was just like, I, I need a break. And so I hit pause and I looked up and I was like, I've got an hour left. Because it felt like the same amount of time had passed in the earlier Brave example. I suppose this is a good time to bring up my next thing. My next uh, idea. This is actually idea three now. So um, what happens is he's a bumbling idiot. But then the human helps him. Oh, hey, that sounds like the symbiotic thing I was talking about earlier. And he's, he's a bumbling idiot. That's great. That's great. And uh, at 36 minutes in, hey, I wrote down that, we see, we see the Styrochosaurus and his symbiotes. There you go. There's an idea right there. Show how, if you don't want to have the humans, which is fine, as we already pointed out, show how the dinosaurs have started to work with the animals in order to mutually benefit. 
the animals can do the little things that they don't because they have smaller claws and actual, you know, uh, the ability to grasp things better. So, you know, like those little, the ropes that tied around the logs that were connected to the hives that had the tiny little holes they could get the seeds out of. Those could have been built by creatures or critters who were working with the apatosaurs. And the apatosaurs actually do the hard, large-scale manual labor that the critters can't do. Both do part of the work, both benefit from it. And that could have been the, the core premise right there, showing how these dinosaurs coexist with all the other animals around them in a similar manner to what a society would, right? So that's idea number three. I actually got one more. Get to that in a minute. So here's when I bring up the pacing. Yep. And, uh... Uh, okay, credit where credit is due. There's a scene, I'm just racing through this film. There's a scene where they put the sticks up to show family and then they draw the circle around it and then they knock over the stick and bury it to show that that family member's dead. Credit where credit is due. It's an excellent way to animate that. It is a smart decision and it's a good way to showcase it. A plus, whoever came up with that idea, whoever that is. It's probably a group. <laughs> um, then we have a needless flashback because because we got to pad this thing for some freaking reason. And then we meet Thunderclap. This is actually when we meet Thunderclap for the first time. Okay, and then they leave. And they run into the T-Rexes. The T-Rexes are great, actually. Probably the best part of the whole film for me. Not just because they're T-Rexes and not just because of Sam Elliott, but because it feels like the part of the movie that most actually represents a film. That sounds like an insult, and that's because it is. This section, just slice this up and out from the rest of the film. Rome Apatosaurus comes with a human child and runs into a bunch of T-Rexes who are jovial and coordinative and, and not just going to eat them. They're not villains. They're not enemies. They're just people. Like, hey, they're ranchers. I mean, that makes sense. It really does, actually, if you think about it. Carnivores being ranchers? Yeah. And they're they're currently dealing with some rustlers who have been poaching them. So okay, we got to go deal with the rustlers. So he ends up working with them, kind of comes overcome some of his own issues and problems. Has the closest thing to an actual character arc for Arlo within this tiny little section, where he not only overcomes some of his fears, but actually learns how to be useful to how to use his particular talents for the betterment of a group that can't do what he can do. They're all friendly and helpful with him. They're, they're almost universally nice about this. And they mention trade. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And they start swapping stories. And then there's this great part where Sam Elliott... I, I don't remember the name of the Rex, I'm sorry. But Sam Elliott's character, uh, you know, the big T-Rex, says, Of course I was afraid. If you're, if you're not afraid of fighting a giant crocodile that can bite your face off, you aren't living. It's dealing with the fear that's the important part. And he's absolutely right. Courage doesn't mean being unafraid. Courage means doing and not allowing fear to stop you. It's the closest thing to a theme the whole film has, and it really only exists here, in this tiny little window. And you can see how there's actual elements of a film here. But I mentioned that I was going to talk about the uh, trade thing. This is idea number four or five? I've lost track. This is my biggest idea, and the most expensive one. This is the one that would be the least likely to actually make, and this would only really work if they'd made it this way from the word go. I would make this a journey film. Now, I know what you're thinking. Isn't it? No, because there's no journey. They walk about a day's travel that way, and then they walk about a day's travel back. That's not a journey. I'm talking, they end up over here, you know, over in eastern Canada, and have to make their way all the way back to here, crossing multiple terrains, multiple biomes, and what effectively happens is a series of short stories. And as they go through, Arlo and, you know, Spot who would either be a straight-up human or a dog, whichever works for you. I, I do think both would work, just in different ways. But um, Ar Arlo and Spot, they learn a little bit more about each other, grow a little bit closer, grow a little more confident, and we have an arc for them that crosses all the little short stories as we're going through it. And each short story gives us a chance to see another insight into how the modern society works with the dinosaurs, or the dinosaurs and the humans, or the dinosaurs and the animals, however you want to actually take that. All of those ideas are not mutually exclusive to this one. You can see why this would be the most expensive, though, because you would have to have, like, a section up here, and then a section up here, and then a section up here, and then a section up here, and each one of these would have their own contained mini-stories and mini-arcs until they make their way through it, either by succeeding, or by failing, or by straight-out avoiding and just rushing through and trying to get on, and then moving further west until they can make their way back home. 
an actual journey that shows multiple facets of the new society, thus answering the what-if question, that also allows for character arcs for Spot the Dog or Spot the Human, which also allows for Arlo to grow as a person throughout it. Now, what does trade have to do with this? I like the idea that this is kind of a, a pseudo-tribal society thing, a little more advanced in some ways, but also still very much tied to that. Remember how I mentioned the symbiotic thing? You know, the, the, the animals do one work and the dinosaurs do the other work, right? Well, that's trade right there. That is straight up a barter economy that I just described. Thus, Arlo and Spot, as they're going, would have to trade their way through to earn their weight, earn their place, earn their food, earn their rest, maybe earn some protection, maybe fail at it and have people come after them, depending on the circumstances. There's, there's so many different individual ideas you can do there, but that barter economy would be a regular element of each one. The idea came to me as I was watching Arlo trade with the T-Rexes. No, not the offer for the grasshopper to, to trade for Spot. That's not what I mean. I mean, Arlo rushes out there. So they save Arlo from the, the not pterodactyls. Cool. Pterodactyls. Then Arlo helps them pull up the rustlers. Then Arlo and the T-Rexes help each other. Then Arlo helps them move the, the cattle. There's the trade. Both sides offering services in exchange for the other. Bam! There's the idea right there. And they just slowly work their way, literally as well as metaphorically, across the country until they get back home. Again, though, that would be pricey. I will admit that. That'd make a good film, though. So then uh, Thunderclap shows up again. Okay, that's cool. And there's a storm. And that's that's cool, I guess. Oh, there's also a tiny little tidbit. Uh, there's this bit where it's like the first snow. It's early this year. This is the third and final reference to that. I have a very strong feeling that somewhere in the sea of rewrites, there was a, a plot about how they were ent either entering into an ice age or there was some kind of environmental issue going on, or that was going to be one of the major threats they faced was just literally the winter and surviving it. Instead, it just gets these three references and feels like a background plot that goes nowhere and is never mentioned again. So I, I have no idea. I can only speculate. Anyways. So then they have the final encounter, which is really boring. I'm sorry. I don't have a better way to say it. There's the super hurricane. There's the mudslide. Okay, I'll give you that one. The mudslide looks terrifying. As it should be. It's a mudslide. <sighs> yeah, trees being pulled up by the roots. Yeah. I'm not going to comment on the hurricane thing. Uh, and while this is going on, by the way, there's also the, the pterodactyls, because we have to have the villains again. Then they're defeated. Okay. That's cool. And then um, they, you know, hey, you should stay with your family. And there's, there's a big scene that... Okay, real talk. Almost every Pixar film has had a feels moment for me. The Pixar, Pixar tears scenes, I keep calling these. Is there a Pixar tears scene in this film for you? Real question. Because there was not for me. And I don't say that joyously. I, I never get that. I never get that kind of vindictive, oh, this sucks kind of mentality. For me, it always makes me sad when I have to say something sucks. Because it sucks. And so I'm just sitting here watching the scene, and I'm like, this feels like the, the music and the framing and the, the slow pace. This feels like this should be the feels moment, but it's not. I didn't feel a damn thing. And I'm just sitting there like, I was anticipating it. I was waiting for it. Like, come on, redeem yourself film. I wanted it because I liked the T-Rex section. I did. So I like, maybe there's one other nugget of something. No. So we go home. He makes his spot. Ha ha ha. Makes his mark. The end. That's it. Oh, what a disaster. You know what's really sad? I was thinking about this. If you think about it from a purely pragmatic perspective... This film, it was the correct thing to do to release it, because at least that way they'd make some of their money back. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made any of the money back, and all that time and effort put in years of development into this film would be just completely torpedoed, right? You know, a total waste. But on the other hand, there's also the whole customer trust thing and trying to actually make sure that you have customers for tomorrow, not just today concept. And so whether it was the correct, or let me say that differently, whether it was the right decision or not to release this film is something I'm not prepared to answer. 
Lord knows that the, f- the films would start doing better pretty much immediately after this, and by the time Coco comes out, most people would agree that Pixar had found their mojo again. But either way, I do hope you've enjoyed my thoughts, such as they are. Oh, this has been an exhausting one, guys. I'll see you next time.